Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. This evening I'm joined by a local celebrity, a nationally known speaker, all around good guy, Dr. Charlie Self, also known as Dr. History, if people have heard him on KSFO and other places. It's Thanks for joining us. It's wonderful being with you and wonderful to get to talk about the issues of the day. <laughs> well, we're definitely going to talk about those, but the first order of business is how did you end up going down this path in the first place, being a historian, outspoken, uh, spreading your opinions uh, across the, the country. What got you started? Well, I think what, what got me started was growing up with a wonderful love of learning. I want to give real credit to my dad and grandfather who had history degrees from Harvard. And when I was growing up, I could tell you political platforms when I was five or nine years old. And uh, so I grew up loving learning. And then as I answered a real sense of calling to being a, a minister and a missionary, that also fueled that love of learning and that love of a variety of cultures and personalities and people. And I began to look for what principles bring us together. I have my faith commitment, and I certainly want people to share that, but I also looked for the common good. What brings us together? And as I studied American history, as well as Latin American history, European history, I have three degrees in history. Um, as I studied our own nation's history, I came to to realize the brilliance of what our founders put together. And so with their brilliance in mind, the desire for the common good, and a whole variety of experiences as a minister, in business, in education, in community service, it's really brought those threads together now, and I have mm -hmm. a chance to really encourage people to flourish. And so let's take a step back for a second and talk about that brilliance. What particularly, were there two or three things that really stood out to you about yes. the founding and that brilliance that you mentioned? Well, there's three things that are of utmost importance that I, I fear we're forgetting. First of all, that government exists to protect God-given or natural rights, not bestow them. Uh, secondly, in order to have liberty, you have to be self-regulating and have a certain amount of virtue. Morality, reverence for God, or at least respect for first principles and respect for others is critical. And then thirdly, you need economic liberty. Mm -hmm. this, this idea of real opportunity in an open system of economics no cronyism, no mercantilism. We would say no communism today, no crony capitalism. Our founders understood all three of those things. Mm -hmm. And that one's life is freest when it's closest to one's own personal responsibility. And the government that governs best is the one that governs wisely, and in many cases, after one has governed themselves and allowed the community and the family and other systems to be in charge instead of a federal or state government. So you're talking about government working as an arbitrator instead of a dictator? I love your words, and I, I, I could not have said it better. It's government really protecting what are the rights, privileges, and opportunities that are inherent to being human and to flourishing. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is, the one, is a wonderful summary of the s sacredness of life. From conception to coronation, mm -hmm. we want to protect that. L um, liberty is not the liberty to do anything I want at any time, but that, that freedom to fully develop my gifts and talents. And the pursuit of happiness is to fully realize my potential within a moral and social system. Mm -hmm. So our founders understood that. And if you read our Constitution and read all of the amendments that have come to it, it's been the greatest self-regulating experiment in liberty in human history. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the focus of your newest book as well, right? How a, a local person uh, or a local community can make a huge impact, not only on a local level, but beyond, even a global 
perspective. Yeah. My book is called Flourishing Churches and Communities. As a minister, I want to connect Sunday and Monday. Right. I want people to know that their faith commitment makes a difference when they go to work. But beyond just my own ministry or the ministry of a parish priest or, or pastor, I'm concerned that people realize they can make a huge difference, whether they volunteer, whether they're paid, whether they're in labor or leadership, that all of their work has inherent dignity. And we can create economic and social capital every day of our lives. It's interesting that you've got such aggressive goals as linking Sunday to Monday. See, I'm Catholic, and so we can't link it to the parking lot. No, we park the cars backwards. We speed out. There's tire squeal. But, but, but you're talking about linking all of the aspects of people's lives and yes. helping them be balanced and not in conflict with the, their whatever they do on su Sunday or if right. Saturday is their uh, Sabbath or what have exactly. you, leading a consistent life and even your work being something that can contribute to that larger picture. Part of being fully human is working. Mm -hmm. And I really want to be careful that we understand work is all meaningful and moral activity. Mm -hmm. Whether you're being a parent at home, whether you're being a volunteer in the community, whether you don't have a lot of physical or even mental skills, but you can contribute who you are to making people uh, encouraged, and or whether you're running a business. Work is meaningful moral activity that we do every day. And we're made to make a difference in the world. And I want to link the highest values, devotion, ethics that people have and there's only one set of rules Chris you know it's, there's not there's not one set of rules for a nonprofit or a for-profit there's not one set of rules for a parish or a synagogue or a temple or a mosque and then what another set for business there's one set of excellent principles by which we ought to be operating in a general sense of the common good and I want to be able to have people live integrated lives because mm -hmm. I tell you we get so disintegrated we get so uh, scattered and how busy and how tense life can become but to bring together the spiritual, the psychological, the relational, mm -hmm. a sense of purpose, and then the economic, to bring that together consciously and help people flourish, what, what a great opportunity. Well, and I think it's driven home best by stories like the one you used to open the book about Scotty's Garage. Maybe share with the audience a little bit about that scenario. Well, Scotty's Automotive is a local business, and I, I'm not going to advertise more than that at this point, but Scotty's is a local business, and here's one person, the owner. He employs six other mechanics. His business feeds between 35 and 40 people by, by virtue of that employment. Mm -hmm. They help people hundreds of cars a month, which literally means thousands of hours of productive time gained as cars are repaired, mm -hmm. which means millions of dollars in the local economy, all because one person is a pebble in the pond of positive influence. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes, uh, he helps folks who are in need. He, he loves to share his faith in the appropriate context, but he's, by doing business well, he is doing good for the community. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to put a pitch in here for business. You know, they, we often talk about it, the corporations need to give back to the community. And I admire philanthropy. I admire corporations choosing voluntarily to do all kinds of good things, the Gates Foundation or Apple or others. But the fact of the matter is, if you're running an excellent business and providing jobs, you're already a social good. You're already the engine that makes all the rest of that occur. And I'm not reducing everything to money. We know that life is more than work and more than money. But I, it's so important that we see the social good of business itself. Oh, because I heard that businesses are all evil, especially if they get into your bedroom. But we'll go back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> so uh, so uh, you talked about also, though, that even though maybe he doesn't own a huge philanthropic organization or, or anything, he does things such as um, not doing work that doesn't need to be done on people's cars, yeah. giving discounts for families in need if that's the thing because it's the right thing to do. And, and like you said, just generally doing good. Now, people wouldn't expect the local automotive facility to be something that's a spiritual experience, but you're just talking about if we lead a moral life. Yeah. Well, we that is a spiritual experience. When you do well what you do, and you do it with solid ethical principles, with the good of others in mind, mm -hmm. uh, you are in fact creating an environment that really helps other people flourish. 
But you're uh, so you keep using the F word flourish. Yes, uh, I do. You've you've talked about things like wealth creation, which I've been told is evil. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about what you mean by this the flourishing and this wealth creation thing, and how it's not evil. Well, let's start with the latter phrase, the wealth creation. We don't live in a world of seven billion people with one pizza to share. We live in a world where we can bake more pizzas. Mm -hmm. And what's so extraordinary about the human person is our capacity for creativity, for innovation. Mm -hmm. And so with rudimentary materials, with opportunity, with a combination of factors, we can literally bring wealth into being that was not there previously. Right. Think about the computer industry in our own Silicon Valley. I moved here in 1969 when there were still a lot of working orchards mm -hmm. and uh, the, the city of San Jose was about 300,000 people and we've watched a lot of change and people can lament some of it and welcome other parts of it but there's no doubt that wealth has been created that people's lives have been enhanced and we also forget that economics the economy itself is that exchange of value every day we decide that some of my time and money are worth investing in this product or this service and we exchange value and as we continue to innovate and be creative, everybody gets to benefit. And I'm not a, either a fan or detractor, but people love to bash Walmart, for example. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, in thousands of communities across America, people have access to a world of goods they never had access to before. So good, bad, well, we can evaluate, we can call for improvements. Uh, Washington, D.C. recently foolishly prohibited them from building four stores, and it turned out their, their lowest wage was higher than the lowest wage of the D.C. government itself, and they still kicked them out. And so I, I was sad by that kind of narrow thinking, failing to see that every job you create, a legitimately good job at whatever level, from minimum to maximum, adds to the economy. Right. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about this, uh, this ability to create wealth. And again, life isn't simply money. You can create social capital as well. And that's what our churches, that's what our nonprofits do. That's what the Conservative Forum does mm -hmm. in the exchange of ideas. We, you know, the, if a Conservative Forum and other groups like it, we've decided that it's worth our time and energy to really exchange the ideas and mobilize one another for effective action. That's an exchange, and that's a wealth creation itself. Well, but when you're talking about wealth creation, a lot of times we hear the argument, yeah, but you're creating wealth at someone else's expense. And that's the greatest myth of Marxist economic theory you'll ever hear. This notion that my enrichment or has to come at the expense of another. In fact, that's simple, sometimes that can be true, and we, can, we need to correct those abuses where they're found. I'm a big advocate, and I work with organizations that work against work slavery and sex slavery and human trafficking, which frankly is what's going on on our Mexican-California border right now. It's nothing less than an awful, cynical game, both of politics, but it also underneath the politics and the immigration reform issues, underneath that is a huge amount of human trafficking mm -hmm. that is the abuse of people. We're not talking about that. We're talking about creativity, risk and reward and the opportunity that creates for everyone at every skill set when they engage in that. Let me give you one example from history, Dr. History speaking, okay? Yes. Uh, Cadbury chocolate in Great Britain. We all love chocolate. It was too much. It was so. uh, my waistline's proof. Um, I, my wife has taught me that chocolate's a food group. Uh, but Cadbury chocolate was started by a couple of Quakers. They paid higher wages, had better working conditions, made sure their employees had access to education. They were the envy and sometimes to the consternation of others because they kept growing and flourishing with their sound ethics and in the midst of it created a global brand. The same for Wedgwood China, the same thing. They created it with a with, with the ethics and the good of everybody, from the person at the simplest labor level to the executives. So I think we need to really have a more salutary view of what can happen when entrepreneurship is given free reign within an ethical boundary. And the government didn't mandate all of those things, the access to education or any of that? They just did it of their own free will? Well, educated workers are better workers. Well-fed, well-kept, well-paid workers are better workers. In fact, the best Silicon Valley companies understand that. And so whether you are a security guard, whether you are a contract employee, uh, and I'm using security guards respectfully because I used to be one, mm -hmm. and I know what it's like, both the, both the boredom and the stress mm -hmm. of that job, but whether you're a security guard or whether you're inventing Apple's next product, um, 
well well cared for workers are productive, efficient, and add not only to the profit margin, but they add to the benefit of all the shareholders and ultimately the society at large. So the connectedness of it all is so important. And people often say, well, all those jobs over in China are taking away jobs in America. Well, the answer isn't to complain about that worker in China that finally has plumbing and heat and maybe not living on a dirt floor anymore. The answer is to create something new here. That's only possible when we begin to unleash that creative spirit and create the tax structures and create the environment in which business can flourish, which is why so many are leaving California for Texas. Yeah, that's exactly what popped into my head. Yeah. Uh, same thing. And so I, I don't see the success of India, China, Brazil, other places as taking away from us. It's an opportunity for American creativity, innovation to once again rise. We are still the world's innovators. We're still the world's best leaders. We're still the world's best organizers. And um, we can be it again when it comes to a 21st century economy. Would you say that the foreign country of Texas is taking things away from us? Well, the, Repu <laughs> the, Republic, of, the Republic of Texas who, and when they were first born in 1836, they were called Texians. Um, every year they vote to stay in the Union. It's, uh, it's a symbolic vote. But um, what they're doing extraordinarily well, and, and they're full of conservatives and liberals. They're full of all sure. kinds of different groups of people. But they have figured out both cultural uh, blending and they have figured out how to be kind to business without destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. And I hope California can learn that someday, too. Well, learn versus implement is also a, a, a different scenario. Oh, we've got a lot to learn. So let's put it in context and go back to a, a previous sort of discussion track that we postponed, and, and that is, okay, great. Well, if um, a person is running a business and they are doing things according to their uh, congruent lifestyle that they feel will take care of their spiritual needs as well as their uh, their creativity and their their feeling of wanting to contribute should they should there be a place where we make that stop such as in the recent hobby lobby decision that has uh, launched people first can you give people a little bit of background on what actually happened versus what facebook uh, friends would say happened hobby lobby objected to paying for four out of 20 contraceptive methods it's that simple they didn't object to health care by the way prior to this moment you never heard a single protest of hobby lobby by people right, left, or center, by anybody of any particular group, by people even who despise faith, religion, and conservative values. Not a single word until the moment they said, we're not going to pay for those methods that cause an abortion. Right. That's, that's all they asked for. And their policy actually includes 16 of the 20 already. 16 of the 20. And so this is, this, this is, a, this is an evangelical family that said, we have a, we have, we have a boundary here. Uh, other Catholic organizations, religious as well as others, uh, protested for other reasons. And what we're watching is what is what might be construed as a privilege, what might be construed as a benefit, has is now becoming a right. And this is the most dangerous thing for our populace, is to think of things that used to be benefits, used to be um, extras, now becoming expectations. Mm -hmm. The idea that a business owner is compelled to violate conscience in order to provide something that they feel is detrimental, uh, that our founders would not have even conceived of that kind of scenario. In fact, if you don't like it, you don't have to work for Hobby Lobby. Right. But what we've done, we've been on a 100-year trajectory of ever-increasing federal governing of our lives, and we need to, and we're beginning to see the opportunity to turn that back. And that that comes back to self-regulation, comes back to strengthening our families, our parishes, our local governments, our local volunteer agencies. And Hobby Lobby stood their ground, and I'm grateful that the decision came the way it did. But we're going to have many more like it into the future, mm -hmm. and that's where we need to take notice. Right. And so what do you say to people who um, feel that it's a vi if they're in disagreement with 
your philosophy that you have to comply with theirs i mean is that self governing or is that something else and how do you how do you mentally address that well we need a robust discussion on what common good means we need a robust discussion of what social ethics means and i'm saying this very seriously because there is there has to be a consensus the great writers of the 16 17 1800s talked about that social contract mm -hmm. whether they were religious or secular this notion that there's a agreement upon sort of rules of the road that we need to abide by. Mm -hmm. The last 50 years, we've lost a good part of that consensus. If you had polled a Democrat or Republican uh, in 1960, even 1970, they would have aligned very similarly on most issues of, of, of family, of faith, of work, of just personal responsibility. Today, we have got a completely different environment. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to return to the important notion of self-regulation and turn to the notion that government comes after self and family and church and voluntary organizations and local government and state government. The federal government is last in line, not first in line. So we've only got a few minutes left, but talk to me about how you would solve this problem if if you were king of the world, which we don't allow here. Yeah, yeah, but, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Your royal titles are honorary in America. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I, I honestly think it begins neighbor and neighbor and neighbor together, bringing good to their local community. So I live in Campbell. Mm -hmm. My wife and I consciously think of ways that we can contribute to the Campbell economy, to the arts, to the civic good. Uh, we've we've been investigating new things that we can do. Um, so it begins it begins with you finding those two or three things you're best able to do and doing them well for the good of others. And you notice that starts with a sense of responsibility for others. And this is the critical awakening that has to happen individually and locally before we can hope for national change. That sense of I'm responsible for my life, the life of my family. Uh, parents can send their children to school fed with breakfast, clothed, ready to learn. They can do that. <laughs> really? And, 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 and what we've been told they can't. So, so the school said, we'll provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We'll provide everything you need. Well, pretty soon you create an entitlement mentality. You decrease responsibility. And the loss of empowerment, the loss of responsibility is actually a dehumanizing thing. Mm -hmm. And so a moral and spiritual awakening of one's responsibility for the good of others is the critical starting point. And then act locally. Start a business. Um, you know, plant your parish well. Mm -hmm. uh, begin that voluntary agency. It's been fun to watch the conservative forum, and I'm un unapologetic to, to promote it, to watch them grow. I was there early in the history and spoke at an event with 80, 90 people, and now there are hundreds. Well, someone had the vision to do that and, and keep it going. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start there. Right. I'm still hopeful for our nation. I'm even hopeful for our state, because if we can do something locally and demonstrate the economic and social and moral good, it mm -hmm. can begin to have a wonderful effect. And even those people they call undocumented mm -hmm. share many of our values. And as we wrestle with those issues, we can be persuasive relationally and locally. Right. And so what if somebody's not ready to take care of other people? Or do you give them permission to at least start taking responsibility for themselves? Is that's that an okay baby step? That's where it all starts. <laughs> if, if one, and to realize that responsibility isn't a burden, it's what makes you a human being. Right. And I think, that, and back to my favorite word, flourishing here, um, people need that spiritual and psychological sense that they have inherent value, whatever economic level they are, whatever artistic talent they have or don't have, they have value, the dignity of being human, the dignity of the human person, and that every relationship that they have, they can take responsibility to try to bring good to it. I wake up every day with a very simple prayer, let me add value to someone's life, right. let me do something to encourage Courage another today. And that's a great way to start, but we start with self-regulation. And so if people want to learn more, or they're looking to you to motivate them, uh, how can they find out more information? DrCharlieSelf.com is my website. That's DrCharlie with an IE self.com. And I'd love to be, carry on the conversation. They can find out about all my writings and different ideas there and email me. And I actually do answer my email and my cell phone. 
And Facebook, I found as well. Yeah, I'm a Facebook guy. I think I have about 2,500 friends on Facebook now. Nice. And I'm going to start do, be doing the Twitter thing, even though I'm an older gentleman. It's time to start doing Twitter as well soon. You'll have beaten me because I still haven't caught we'll up with the, the Twitter thing. We'll have fun doing it. But I, I love the conversation and love to be able to help people discover their destiny. Well, thank you for sharing that today, Charlie. And if you'll hold on for just a moment, Absolutely. we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. And yes, we do appreciate the fact that they make this show possible for us, but what they're best known for is actually their speaker series. And on the first Tuesday of each month, except for in July and then starting in November, that will be the second Tuesday of each month, the Forum presents a speaker series at 432 Stearland Road, about three minutes from here in Mountain View. And this evening, the July session, we'll be uh, hearing from Trevor Loudon, the author of The Enemies Within. He came all the way from New Zealand, so if you can check him out, please do. In August, uh, Gun Owners of America will be speaking about the Second Amendment. On September 2nd, Mark Mix, President of National Right to Work, will be speaking. And then October 7th, Pam Geller will be speaking about Islam. And I'm sure that will be a heavily attended uh, presentation as well. So if you need more information about the Conservative Forum, you can find that at theconservativeforum.com. In closing, I just want to reiterate what Charlie said about you being able to make an individual difference, not only locally within your community, but to the wealth and well-being of your community and to the world as a whole. Uh, you have the ability to do that through your normal everyday life and find something that gives you purpose that you can be passionate about and be unapologetic about going out doing that well, and making a difference. On that note, I'd like to close with just saying thank you for joining us. I've been Chris Pareja, and still am. <laughs> this has been The Right Side, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. Have a great night.